Hello, Malcolm here and welcome to the third teaching class in the series on 1 Thessalonians for the Thames Valley and Watford Churches of Christ, beginning of 2023. And today we're in chapter 2 and looking at verses 1 to 12. And we're focusing on this issue. So let me ask you a question. Is How would you like to be part of a faith community, a family group, a location, a congregation as a whole? How would you like to be part of a group like that, which is characterized by deep, abiding love? I doubt I'm going to get anybody that says, no, I don't want that. But what does it mean? What does it look like? And I think this, these 12 verses can teach us a lot about how we can develop that and what it means to have that and what our part is in it and what our, our congregational responsibilities are. So let's have a look at what we can find here to help us to develop that kind of deep abiding love that is so characteristic of what it means to be a Christian. It's by our love for one another the world will know that we're Christ's disciples, Jesus said in John chapter 13. And here we see it uh, lived out and developed in a congregation, a congregation in Thessalonica. So let's see what we can learn from this. Let's have a read first of the 12 verses. I'll paraphrase a little bit, uh, but let's, let's go through it. So he says here, our visit to you wasn't uh, without results. Uh, we'd previously suffered in Philippi, but with God's help, we dared to tell you his gospel, God's gospel, in the face of strong opposition. Uh, the appeal we make doesn't spring from error or impure motives. We're not trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please God, uh, people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery. Uh, we didn't put on a mask to cover up greed. God's our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Uh, we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but also our lives as well. Surely you remember a toil, hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. A lot here about relationships, isn't there? Now, let's do a little bit of background, and then we'll dig into uh, a few bits and pieces, and then I'll ask some questions. So Paul's saying at the beginning here, the results are in, right? You know what we were like. You know that our time with you was productive, that a lot of you became Christians, and uh, well, you all did, the, the, <laughs> reading this letter, and that there was a, a powerful effect for God from our preaching and teaching and the way we were with you. We'd had a terrible time in Philippi, but despite that, we, God gave us the courage to preach to you, and uh, even though there was some strong opposition, and this appeal we make. So what's going on here is it looks like uh, back in Thessalonica, there are some people saying, this guy Paul, there's some people opposing the church saying, this guy Paul, he was here three weeks, he's disappeared, he's gone for probably at least a year at this point. Where is he? Didn't he say he was coming back? He's not come back. Can you really trust him? Did you ever really even know him? How, how well can you know someone you've only met for three weeks? And here you are, radically changing your lives, uh, becoming ostracized in society, separated from, uh, for some people at least, I would imagine, their livelihoods. I mean, why are you doing this? You're in trouble with, uh, if they were a Jew, with, with the Jewish uh, community. They're in trouble with the Roman authorities or the Gentile authorities, the pagan temples and their priests and priestesses and, and, and the authorities. And, and all because of this bloke, Paul, you barely even know. And so it's probable that that's what's going on. So Paul is giving a sort of defense of himself here, but it's a very interesting way that he goes about it. So first of all, he talks about motives. So that's what we're going to talk about just for a few minutes here. It's about motives. Motives in relationships matter, don't they? Uh, it's not just what we can bring to a relationship with our gifts, whether we can make people laugh or whether we can listen well or whether we have particular wisdom. It's not Those are not the things that cement uh, or, or should be under underpinning the relationships. What underpins the relationships is that we have pure motives in building those relationships. That's true when we reach out to people who are not part of our community, but it's also true within the community. We've got to have pure motives in being with one another. And that's what Paul emphasizes here. Uh, we, it, we didn't have impure motives. We weren't trying to trick you. We weren't trying to get something from you without you realizing it. On the contrary, it's God who approves of us. We're not trying to please people. We're trying to please God. 
He's the one to test us. You know we didn't use flattery. Of course, flattery generally doesn't get, get you uh, stoned or flogged or put in prison, right? Uh, so he's, this chimes with their experience of him. Uh, we didn't put on a mask to cover up greed. What you saw was what we got, what you got. In particular, he mentions greed here probably because there may have been accusations that he'd been making money from the Thessalonians. Thessalonians and of course, actually he hadn't, as he goes on to point out, we, uh, we worked night and day, physically working for our keep so that no one could say that we were getting money from you. It's not that he thought that being paid was wrong, but in this context for this congregation, it was better that he wasn't paid. So you know it wasn't about greed. We're not looking for praise from you. Uh, we, we could have asserted our authority, he says. We could have. I mean, think about Paul. He's the man who's met Jesus. None of them have met Jesus. He could have come into town and said, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you how to live. I'm going to tell you what to believe. I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. And none of you can contradict me. And none of you can question me. And none of you can doubt me because I'm an apostle. I have met Jesus. And all those other experiences he had, the, 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 the spiritual gifts he had, the, the, uh, the, 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 the ability to heal, but he says, that's not how I came to you, right? And you can imagine the congregation going, do you know, he's right. He didn't come standing on his authority. Instead, he came, well, we'll talk about the practicalities of what we see here in a moment. But first of all, he says, my motives were pure. And they could tell his motives were pure because he, he didn't get much out of this, did he? His time in Thessalonica after Philippi was characterized by, by struggle. And, by, and there was a, a riot, and then he had to flee. They, in fact, the church sent him away. Suffering is characteristic for those who want to be messengers of God, and suffering is characteristic of those who want to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. Uh, he got suffering, not riches, from his service to them. His motives were pure. You can tell uh, people's motives by, by whether, how they handle suffering, how they handle opposition. That's even true in church. Uh, we got to love people through the suffering of opposition and the suffering of controversy and the suffering of disagreement. That's something that Paul did really well. Uh, his motives were pure. He wasn't being tricky with them. Um, doing what he did uh, for them in the way he did it isn't usually the kind of thing that gets you beaten up. This, you could say, applies to leadership. But does it really apply to me, a uh, lowly church member who is not a leader? Yes, Paul, of course, had to have pure motives. But what about the rest of us? I mean, you know, whatever. I, I think we've got to understand that what Paul's reflecting here are the ideals of what it means to be a disciple. He's actually describing Jesus because Jesus was more pure motivate, purely motivated than anybody, including Paul. But these are characteristics which are of Christ. And a disciple wants to be as much like Christ as we can be. So these things do apply to us. And so thinking about your relationships, how purely motivated are you? Do you love people for love's sake or for what you may receive? Do you only attend meetings for what you're going to get or are you there to give to other people? These are common questions we often ask each other, but they're important to reflect on every now and again. Do we only text messages people or WhatsApp them or whatever medium we use do we only do that because we want to get a reply or do we offer time and energy to others because it's the right thing to do because we love God in the end this is what God does for us all the time then do we not then pass that on in love uh, to quote from Rebecca de Young in her book Glittering Vices she says the hallmark of well entrenched greed then is a willingness to use people to serve our love of money rather than use of money to serve our love for people. And she's talking here specifically about money, but this could be about many things. So do we, uh, are we, uh, as she says here, willing to use people to serve our love of money? So we use people for money's sake, or we use people because it makes us feel good rather than using our money to serve our love for people, using our resources, our home, our time, our energy, to, to love others. That's the right way around, isn't it? It's all about character. I've got another quote on that from a book by Joseph Stowell, but I'll put that in the show notes, which I think you may find useful to reflect on. So the question here in this section is this, and I think this is a good group discussion question. How can you be sure what your motives are? 
How can you know your motives? And then how can you refine your motives to make sure that you're loving people, engaging with people for their benefit in Christ, with God's help, rather than for yourself? How do we know the difference? Some of us may be more self-aware of this kind of thing than others. And it's not something that's innate to some of us, at least. But nonetheless, we can learn and we can grow to become aware of our tendencies and our motivation. And let's discuss this together. How can we be more aware of our motivation and make it as pure as it can be in our treatment of other people like Paul and, in fact, Silas and Timothy? Now, let's go on to our second point here, which is to look at the practicalities of the way that Paul treated people from verse 7. So he said, instead, we're like young children. Young children or babies may be more the right translation. Uh, I recently had the privilege of holding my great niece, Freya. Uh, my uh, niece, Emma, had her second child recently. Last weekend, I was seeing her and some other relatives, and uh, she uh, graciously allowed me to hold baby Freya in my arms. And what a joy uh, that was. Little baby, cute. I was able to hold her for a little while, actually, and sit in a chair and play with her a little bit. And uh, what a... It's just, it's just a lovely thing, isn't it, to, to have a little baby like that. Um, what Paul's talking about here is we were like that with you, me, the Apostle Paul. I was like a little child. What is he talking about here? And I think this is a good, again, group discussion, dis group discussion question. But ask yourself that question. In what way could an adult like Paul be a child or a baby among the Thessalonians? I think to some extent it means he was almost invisible. You know, a small child is cherished, but isn't the one up front at a microphone uh, uh, being prominent. Uh, they're almost invisible. They're just held. Uh, they're not a hero. A little baby isn't a hero. And, and Paul had a heroic qualities at many times in his life, but he wasn't there to be a hero. That wasn't his point. Uh, there's a gentleness implied. There's a dependency implied. As if Paul needed them as much as they needed him. Isn't that important in leadership? To understand, it is true, by the way, to understand, whether we know it or not, to understand that leaders need everybody else as much as everybody else needs them. It, it is absolutely two-way. So that's one point here to discuss. What does that mean? And the second is, he says, we were like a, a nursing mother. We were like a nursing mother as a nursing mother cares for her children. What does that mean? In what way could a man like Paul be a nursing mother among the Thessalonians. I, I wasn't able to take my great my niece's place as a nursing mother. She's the nursing mother. What does it mean to be like that with other people? Again, you, a good discussion question for our groups. What, did it, what does it look like? What does it mean? I would say at least it means that uh, he's trying to describe the sense in which they were skin close. You know, a baby and a, and a nursing mother, they are very intimately skin close. They're connected. And maybe it's a bit like that, that sort of sense of, I'm happy for you to be, you know, right there with me, kind of almost skin close. Uh, another image that's the word here is sometimes used for is of a bird keeping its chicks warm. There's a shared warmth going on here. And there's some feeding uh, going on, of course, as well. And then also later on in this uh, section, he says, I, I was like a father, uh, like a father, the way the father deals with his own children. And again, a good discussion question is, in what way could a person like Paul be a father among the Thessalonians? And I particularly like to encourage us to discuss the three words that translate one sort of Greek word here in verse 12 to discuss how we can uh, do this in a way that's healthy in our faith communities. So in verse 12, he said, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So encouraging, comforting, and urging. What does it look like to encourage? What does it look like to comfort? And what does it look like to urge? What does it feel like to receive encouragement, comfort, and being urged? Because those of us who uh, want to encourage, comfort, and urge also need to be willing to receive encouragement, comforting, and I think especially urging, which demands more humility probably than the other two, though that's debatable. But anyway, think about that, discuss that. Um, I find myself more comfortable encouraging and comforting than at urging. That's how I feel, whether you receive it that way or not. I don't know, but that's my feeling of it. And in fact, this is my theme verse for the year. I've chosen this as my personal theme verse in my relationships with other people 
is to learn better how to encourage and comfort and urge and in teaching and preaching, how better to blend together encouragement and comforting and urging and grow in that. Because I think uh, to be effective with uh, helping each other, we need this. The one and other passages in the rest of the New Testament require us to be at least competent at encouraging one another and comforting one another and urging one another. We may not be equally good at all three, but we can grow in all three because Jesus encouraged and he comforted and he urged. And indeed, our Father God does the same, Old and New Testament. So how are you doing? How are you doing at encouraging each other? How are you doing at comforting other people? How are you doing at urging? How are you at receiving encouragement, receiving comfort, receiving urging? How is your whole group? How would you say? We discussed this together with your group. How are we all doing here? How's our group doing? Are we encouraging one another? Are we? In what way are we doing that? Are we comforting one another? How is that going? Really? Actually, not just in theory, but really. And how is it going at urging one another to live lives worthy of God? How are we really doing at that? I think it's a really healthy discussion. It's not like we're ever going to be perfect at it, but we can get better at it, can't we? And I think there's a connection here with chapter 1, verse 3, which is our theme verse for the year, where it says, We remember your work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That looks to me a little bit like encouraging and comforting and urging. I wonder what you think about that. Well, let me stop there and leave that with, there with some thoughts for us to consider. I wonder what you think about this. This is a phenomenal passage. I think Paul's example with the Thessalonians is an upward call in all my relationships with people. And I like that focus he has there of being like a child, a nursing mother and a father and thinking about these different ways in which we can deepen our love for one another. Uh, do you need to be more like a child, more like a nursing mother, more like a father? And how are you doing at that balance and blend of encouraging, comforting and urging one another and receiving it yourself. I'll leave you with those thoughts and let me know what you think. If you want to uh, send me a comment, send it to malcolm at malcolmcox.org or wherever you see this recording. Please pass the recording on. I'm sure other people may benefit from it. And until the next time, I hope you find ways to purify your motives and treat one another like a child, like a nursing mother, like a father, encouraging, comforting, and urging each other to live lives worthy of God. Take care, and God bless.